It's Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson. How in the world are you today? Thanks a lot for tuning in. WAVA 105.1 FM right here out of Arlington, Virginia, covering all of the DMV. That's D.C., Maryland, Virginia, parts of West Virginia and Pennsylvania as well. And, of course, all over the world on uh, WAVA.com. And waving at you, giving you my sideways peace sign for those of you who are watching on social media at Anderson Speaks is my handle there. Well, this is Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson, and today we are dealing with the wisdom of reckoning with race. If you're new to the show, let me tell you how we roll. First of all, we've got Marriage Mondays, Tough Topic Tuesdays, Wisdom Wednesdays, Theological Thursdays, and then, of course, Open Phone-In Fridays. Anything you want to talk to me about on Friday is fair game. But today is Wisdom Wednesday, and we're going to be talking with a couple of special guests while we are in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And in just a moment, you're going to meet uh, Hannibal Johnson, and later on you'll meet Phil Armstrong. Hannibal Johnson's the curator of the Greenwood Rising Museum, and uh, Phil Armstrong is the museum's interim executive director. Now, before we get started, as we always do, I want to give you the number and open in a short word of prayer, and then we're going to talk with Hannibal Johnson, the curator of uh, Greenwood Rising uh, Museum, not to mention he's the author of a brand new book. You'll want to make sure you Google and pick it up, Black Wall Street 100. That's by Hannibal B. Johnson. I'm holding it up for you, those of you who are on social media. But first, let's bow for a short word of prayer. Dear God, we so thank you for giving us an opportunity to have conversations to help us to grow so we can learn what it means to be true uh, reconcilers. So we ask that you bless today's guest and today's show and all my listeners. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen and amen. Well, again, to get a hold of us, you can always go to andersonspeaks.com. That's andersonspeaks.com. You can go to my favorite website, Embrace Gracism. Dot com. That's gracism. Racism is a bad word. Gracism is a good word. It's extending grace to people, regardless of their color, class, or culture. Pick up the book today, Gracism, the Art of Inclusion. Uh, but today, if you want to call me right now, live, I will open the phone lines, but I'm telling you now, I might just hog all the time. But get in where you fit in, all right? Our call screen is waiting for you. Here's the number, 888-432-7434. That's 888-432-7434. If you're trying to memorize a number, I know you're driving around the Beltway somewhere. Just remember the word bridge, 888-43 bridge. Now, Hannibal B. Johnson is a graduate of Harvard Law School. He uh, did his undergraduate work at the University of Arkansas, where he completed a double major in economics and sociology. He's also an attorney and author, an independent consultant specializing in diversity and inclusion, cultural competence issues, and nonprofit governance. He's an adjunct professor at the University of Tulsa College of Law, as well as the Oklahoma State University. Uh, and so many other uh, accolades this gentleman has. But Mr. Johnson serves on the federal 400 Years of African American History Commission. It's a body that was charged with planning, developing, and implementing activities appropriate to the 400th anniversary of the arrival in 1619 of Africans in the English colonies at Point Comfort, Virginia. He also chairs the Education Committee for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. He is an author of several books, including one you may see here. If not, again, you can Google it, Black Wall Street. Here's a subtitle, From Riot to Renaissance in Tulsa's Historic Greenwood District. But the one that is new that you might want to pick up is Black Wall Street 100. And here's a subtitle, an American city grapples with its historical racial trauma. Mr. Hannibal Johnson, so good to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, so uh, we're going to learn from you what is Black Wall Street. But before we do that, uh, you're the curator here uh, at the Greenwood Rising Museum. What's a curator? What do you do? 
So I served as local curator for this facility, the Black Wall Street History Center called Greenwood Rising, working mm -hmm. in conjunction with a group out of New York City called Local Projects. They do work all over the world. They mm -hmm. did the Equal Justice Institute in Mon Montgomery. They've mm -hmm. done stuff really, again, all over the world. They're fantastic to work with. Uh -huh. So my role as local curator really is to set the narrative tone for the facility. Uh -huh. This is not an artifact-centric facility. It's a narrative-centric facility. So it tells mm, a, a story, story. Yeah. in a way that is robust, but also experiential. And it also focuses on uh, making sure patrons are aware of the through line, the connection yeah. of our history to our present. Well, that through line is something that I don't think we've gone through when it comes to understanding Black Wall Street. Many people don't even know what it is, hadn't heard about it. I talk to people and they're like, really? This? What are you talking about? So why, is, why hasn't this been a part of the through line of American history? By the way, you know, I should start with what is Black Wall Street? Let's go there first. So Black Wall Street is really a reference to the economic and entrepreneurial success that existed in this relatively narrow geographic area in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a 35 mm -hmm. square block area. And it, there was a concentration of small businesses, mom and pop type operations primarily. So grocery stores, um, restaurants, movie theaters, mm -hmm. hotels, dance halls, haberdasheries, mm -hmm. jetney services, and on and on. Plus a concentration of professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, and dentists. And they're all concentrated within it, a 35 block period, uh, uh, geographical area. And they were concentrated because they had to be, because uh -huh. this was a rigidly segregated community. I see. So I say that they faced an economic detour, which is to say that these people, when they approached the gates of economic opportunity in white Tulsa, they were turned away. They created their own community mm. in this space where dollars circulated and recirculated ironically that lifted up the community economically right right it reminds me of like the black church when people are like why well, you got a, a black church and, and you remind them in history well the black church really it was the only way blacks could get together because they weren't allowed in white church you know yeah, why do we have black colleges yeah why do we have black colleges yeah. so you've heard this before right and so in a sense we have this uh uh black geographical area where businesses are thriving it became a, a beautiful thing though right like there was black wealth it, it did uh, booker t washington dubbed this the negro wall street of america and mm -hmm. that just sort of modernized or morphed into black wall street but i tell people that that's real, black wall street really, really in many ways is a misnomer because it wasn't it wasn't a banking community or an investment community uh -huh. it was a small business community so uh -huh. black main street would have been a more appropriate oh label. Let's see, they should have got you to name that man uh, black main street so that's where a lot of the businesses that were black owned uh, came together and uh, there was wealth within the community. So uh, when, we, when we get back in just a moment, we're gonna ask you, so what happened in 1921? And uh, understand that you're saying it was vibrant, there was wealth, there was business, there were barbershops and restaurants and hotels. It was all flowing just fine, but an incident happened. And as a result, we are now talking 100 years later. Let's find out what happened and why it matters today. You're listening to Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson. We'll be right back. It's Best Buy Waterproofing and Best Buy Design Build. So, who is this superhero guy flying over the neighborhood looking for leaky basements and leaky roofs to repair? Visit BestBuyWaterproofing.com or call 844-980-3707-247 to see what heroic home repair services look like. Basement waterproofing, mold and mildew remediation, structural repair, foundation crack injection, sump pump systems, roofing and gutters, siding and decks. So, you went to BestBuyWaterproofing.com and called 844-980-3707. Who's the real hero now? You are. Under one roof, from one side to the other. Under one roof, from the inside out. We've got you covered from top to bottom. At Best Buy, your whole house is our business. Best Buy! 
We all want to get back to normal, and getting the COVID-19 vaccine puts us closer to that goal. Getting vaccinated is a critical step towards reducing the impact COVID-19 has on our family, friends, and neighbors. Did you know hundreds of thousands of Prince Georgians have received at least the first dose? This is huge, and we need your help to continue fighting the virus by getting vaccinated. Vaccinations are now available at Prince George's County operated COVID-19 clinics for individuals 12 and older who live or work in the county. Eligible individuals do not need an appointment to get vaccinated, but do require consent from a parent or legal guardian for individuals 17 and younger. So get vaccinated today and let your family, friends, and community know that you're proud to be protected. Visit mypgc.us forward slash COVID vaccine to learn more. If you live in the Bowie, Greenbelt, Glendale, or Woodmore area, anywhere in that vicinity, guess what? Laser Landscaping LLC wants to make your lawn look beautiful. They will mow your lawn. They'll edge around the outskirts of your lawn. They'll put up plants, whatever you need to make your house pop. They'll do it for you. Give them a call, 240-516-4967. That's 240-516-4967. Ask for the owner, Fidel, and tell them that Dr. Anderson sent you. Have you ever listened to Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson and wondered how we come up with heartfelt discussions on Marriage Mondays or engaging topics on Tough Topic Tuesdays? Well, our listeners are our inspiration. We would love to keep hearing from you. So if you have an idea for the show, let us know because comprehension begins with conversation. Send us your ideas by sending an email to info at andersonspeaks.com and join the conversation on Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson. It's Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson, hanging out with Hannibal B. Johnson. He's a curator of the Greenwood Rising Museum. He's the author of multiple books, including the one I'm holding up right now. It's Black Wall Street 100. Check it out. The subtitle, An American City Grapples with Its Historical Racial Trauma. Uh, Hannibal Johnson, welcome to Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson. Great to be here. Thank you for hanging out with us today while we're in Tulsa. Okay, so you are a bit of a historian here when it comes to uh, this topic of Black Wall Street. 1921, what happened? Before talking about what happened, I think it's important to establish the context. So we have, we have a national context of historical racial trauma and violence. Mm -hmm. The summer and fall of 1919, James Weldon Johnson of NAACP called it Red Summer. Red's a metaphorical reference to the blood that flowed in the streets. Mm. In these so-called race riots in places like New York and Philadelphia and Baltimore and in mm. D.C. and in Memphis, Longview, Texas, Omaha, um, so Elaine this is Arkansas, happening all over, all the, over the country. Yeah. The other thing that's happening during this period is lynching. Lynching is a form of domestic terrorism aimed primarily at, at black folks. Mm -hmm. And the idea is not simply to punish an individual or group of individuals, but to send a message to the entirety of the black population right. about their relative place in society. So that's the public lynching. That's a national context uh -huh. for, for, for the run up to this. Um, in addition, there are a couple of things that are unique to Tulsa that set the set the stage for the events in 1921. One was land lust. The black community that we've been talking about, the Black Wall Street community. Which was the Greenwood. Right, which we're mm -hmm. sitting right right here today. Yeah. This was this was land that was desired or coveted by other interests, corporate interests, and the, and the railroads wanted this land. They wanted to move black people farther north. They talked about it before the massacre in 1921. Mm. Um, the other thing is we got to remember that this was a period during which the ideology of white supremacy reigned supreme. Mm. So we have, we have these black folks who are doing well economically. We have some white folks in the community who are doing less well. And, and this can't be tolerated. I mean, right. things are, are out of kilter and they have to be right. righted. Right. So that's a problem. Uh, we had 
some of the largest growth and development of the KKK, the domestic terrorist organization, the Ku Klux Klan, in mm-hmm. Oklahoma and in Tulsa throughout the 20s. And then finally, we had a newspaper here called the Tulsa Tribune, af- daily afternoon newspaper that published a series of incendiary inflammatory articles and editorials that really mm. fomented hostility in the white community mm-hmm. against the black community. Mm-hmm. Tulsa was a tinderbox is what I'm saying. Yeah. And the attitudes were already primed right, uh, uh, and stacked against black people, even though they may have had wealth and, and businesses, they were occupying precious real estate. They were doing well. And you add all these other uh, con- pieces of context to the narrative something was going to happen. Right. So metaphorically, you could think of smoldering embers, and you need some sort of catalyst to really ignite and set the community alight. Mm. So the, the catalyst was an incident involving two teenagers, a black boy and a white girl, on May 30th, 1921, an incident mm. in an elevator that was um, reported by the Tulsa Tribune as an attempted rape of the girl by the black boy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that really got the community up in arms, Um a large white mob gathered. There was talk of lynching the boy, Dick Rowland, after he had been arrested. Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, the larger white group had a conflict with the smaller group of black men, who some of whom were World War One veterans, had weapons, knew how to use them. Mm-hmm. There was a struggle over a gun one of the black men had. The gun discharged, and things went south from there. Mm. The mob of whites numbered in the thousands. Some of the members of the mob were actually deputized by local law enforcement as they invaded the green room community, burning and looting and shooting as they went. Out of anger because of, of what had happened, not only in the elevator, but with the gun going off in that struggle. And so now it's like we're in violence now. Right. I, and, but I would say out of um a delusion in this this ideology of white supremacy. That's the, those are the fundamental causes. Uh-huh. The elevator incident is a trigger is a trigger event. It's a trigger event, and now you've got this standoff, right? And is there a is there a uh, opposite narrative to this story? In other words, uh, is there a narrative out there that's saying, well, actually? The black guy had a gun and he shot someone. They're really the ones that set all this off. Like, is there that narrative or is this a common, everyone agrees, black, white, on the history of what happened? Because you and I know revisionist history uh, is is a constant uh, sort of accusation and Mm -hmm. things become changed through story. If I were to go to some other part of Tulsa or Oklahoma and talked about Black Wall Street, would there would I be sitting on someone's uh, front porch having lemonade and they're like, honey, let me tell you what really happened? Or, or is this a common narrative? Today, there is not really a thriving alternative narrative. Okay. Contemporaneously, mm-hmm. there actually was. Really? So the mayor of the city, T.D. Evans, the city commission, and the chamber of commerce re- called this a Negro uprising. In other words, hmm. those uppity black folks, hmm. if they had just sort of chilled this none of this would have happened so, yeah. that that was the, that was the story at uh-huh. the time okay right I'd, I'd wondered about that so that was the story that was the narrative and of course that got overturned and changed how just by the preponderance of of evidence and things of that sort. yeah the, the great w- weight of the evidence runs counter to this notion of a negro uprising mm-hmm. so as people began to look at this and certainly in recent years as much more historical uh, investigation has been done. Um, that narrative, it, it really has almost no credibility. But now here we are, uh, 100 years later, uh, there's this commemoration that's bringing it to light where many people for the first time may have seen you on CNN or seen, um, you know, the the stories about this in, in, in the media, and they're like, I didn't know anything about this. I know a number of African-American folk who I've talked to about this. And they have no idea. They're like, wow, I, I didn't know that this was a thing. Mm-hmm. Wh- why is that? So how do we know what we know? We, t- we typically know what we know about history because it's part of a curriculum that we're exposed to, either in public or private schools. So right. this, this history, like much other of our hard history, and hard history tends to subsume history around race and race relations and racism. Mm -hmm. It's it's not part of the regular curriculum. So a couple of things happened here as psychological dynamics that that really helped keep this swept under the carpet. One was 
When this happened in 1921, Tulsa was on an upward trajectory, becoming the so-called self-described oil capital of the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Tulsa, the the leadership of Tulsa, these were white men. That that's who they were, who mm -hmm. the leaders were at the time. Mm -hmm. They wanted Tulsa to be seen as a cosmopolitan, welcoming city where businesses could thrive. Mm -hmm. um, the massacre in 1921 was an inconvenient truth for them. So so they didn't mm. want to talk about it. Mm. There were people in Sweep the, it under the rug right. type thing and keep moving. There were other people in the white community who felt really ashamed that they had allowed this to happen in their community. In the black community, there was probably even before the term was coined, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. There was a great deal of, of fear and anxiety associated with the happening of this event. And even survivors, many of whom 20 years ago, met, there were about 100 survivors who were living. Mm -hmm. So I was able to visit with a number of them. We recorded interviews with many of them. They talked about the fact that this wasn't discussed generally in their families because the elders in the families felt it might have some sort of limiting effect on them. So they wanted them to be all that they could be, and they didn't want mm -hmm. to burden them with this hard history. Yeah. So for all, it's a confluence of all these things mm. that led us to where we are uh, today, which is uh, the event happening in 1921, it being not, not discussed beneath the surface for... 70, 80 years, right. and then finally gradually bubbling or percolating to the surface. So why, quote unquote, dig it up now? Well, if we want to do better, be better, and get better, we have to address this hard history. Aren't, we have but a, aren't you just creating division by bringing something up that was 100 years ago? We hear that occasionally. I don't hear as much as I used to. We, we oh, have, I hear it every day uh, it, it, <laughs> in the it, nation's capital on my radio show. Well, if you just stop talking about it, mm -hmm. uh, it'll go away. Why are you being so divisive bringing up race? James Baldwin, the big quote on the side of the building, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until That's, it is faced. Mm, come on, somebody. All right, 888-432-7434. If you want to join the conversation, you surely can. Uh, we might let you in here. 888-43-BRIDGE. Got that? Um, was the violence against black people, did any of that happen prior to the massacre? Do you know, like, we had talked about the context of lynching and things of that sort. Was that seen in Tulsa, or was that just a national narrative? And then all of a sudden, 1921 happens with this, uh, with this incident. Or was there kind of violence toward black people up until this? Do you know my question here? Well, there certainly was in Oklahoma. Uh, let me just give you an example. I think that that's relevant. Mm -hmm. So... Tulsa, the, the state of Oklahoma becomes a, a part of the United States in 1907. So between statehood in 1907 and 1921, the year of the massacre here in Tulsa, there were 33 documented lynchings in Oklahoma. 20, 27 of the lynching victims were black. Mm. So violence against black folks, this sort of systemic anti-blackness, was a thing in Oklahoma as it was a thing in Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia and elsewhere. Hmm. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about Greenwood? Take a minute for people to understand what this neighborhood is now. And Because so, we're learning about this. Is this a, kind of a renaissance? I know one of your books, your subtitle was From Riot to Renaissance in Tulsa's Historic Greenwood District. Yeah, I think arguably the community is in the midst of a renaissance, but... But it's, it, 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 it's a new incarnation of Black Wall Street. This is an integrated community, and Black Wall Street in its heydays was a segregated community. This is an integrated community. It is a multi-purpose, multifunctional community, so there is residential, commercial, entertainment, educational, cultural, and religious, all in this community. Mm. So uh, the real trick is to unite the community around something. We, we Part of that unity comes from, I, I think, a sense of that's shared among all the, the residents of the community currently, that our history is important, that we have to leverage this history, that we sit on sacred ground. Sacred ground, indeed. Well, listen, friends, on the other side of the break, we're going to continue to talk with the curator of the Greenwood Rising Museum. He's Hannibal uh, Johnson. He's the author of a brand new book, Black Wall Street 100. 
Pick it up today. We'll be right back. It's Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson. How in the world are you today? Wherever you are, in your kitchen, in your car, maybe in front of your computer or your smartphone, watch me on my socials. I am uh, hanging out with you right here at Anderson Speaks on Facebook and on YouTube. And of course on WAVA 105.1 FM right out of the nation's capital. You know, in the first half of the show, if you're just joining us, we were talking with Hannibal Johnson. He's a curator of the Greenwood Rising Museum. He also uh, is the author of several different books. And we were just learning from him about uh, the not only Oklahoma, but Tulsa and what the black community was uh, was experiencing a place of wealth and a, a place of unity before the 1921 massacre. Well, guess what? The Greenwood Rising Museum also has uh, an interim uh, executive director. His name is Phil Armstrong, and he's with us. He's joined uh, the conversation. He's a native of Ohio, and Phil Armstrong has made Tulsa his home for more than 20 years. He has a, a varied background with regard to, to leadership and music. He has a bachelor's degree in mass communications from Central State uh, University in Wilberforce, Ohio, and a master's degree in public administration from the University of, of Akron. And Phil uh, works with uh, this 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 museum, we are here. We're in your your space, and one of the things I saw on this wall here, one of these walls, is people can uh, write in what their commitments are uh, to be uh, racial reconcilers. Uh, where'd that idea come from? And tell us a little bit about the museum. So. Um 
right in the midst of a lot of the curatorial work that Hannibal and his team was doing, um, you know, we were going through George Floyd. Mm. And um, that made a lot of us uh, step back. Mm. It made a lot of us uh, think about what we were doing here. Uh, one of the lead uh, project directors for local projects out of New York who helped us design. Her name was uh, an African-American female, uh, um, Loray Arthur Mensa. She had just had a baby boy, and I am a father of two teenage uh, black boys. And one day we just got on the phone and said, you know, uh, we've got one shot to really not just create this place for history. Right for people to get educated and enlightened on this black community, but what are we going to do with this going forward? Uh, and with what's going on with George Floyd around the country, we need to make sure that people are coming and not just walking away, but they realize now that you've received this history, now it's up to you to do something with it. And so uh, with Hannibal and with John West Bay and other, you know, we really started talking about this commitment space and this commitment sculpture. And it was always there kind of from the beginning, but I mm -hmm. think that crystallized the need for it even the more so that when people leave here, um, there's no commitment police to make you do it. Right. But when you're given this amount of wealth of history that has been denied from so many people that they just did not know and the full story and the full narrative and what hate does that builds up and builds up in the racial animosity and what it appears as if in our current climate in our country, especially at that time, that it looks like we're about to repeat some of the things that mm. we just came through 100 years ago, that we have an obligation to commit to racial reconciliation. So it's, do you believe that uh, the George Floyd uh, incident uh, that sparked so much in our country do you believe that that also gave a sense of energy or oxygen to, uh, to say this museum and this story of Greenwood actually needs to be told more in the broader narrative? Like, did it bring energy here at all? It definitely did. Definitely. It did. Um, well, you know, you remember it, it was the 99th year uh, for the commemoration um, that summer of George Floyd. Uh, you had Juneteenth going on. You had the, the president at that time wanting to come to have a rally on Juneteenth in Tulsa. It all eyes were on Tulsa. Oh, yeah. And, and it just, it, we had more people, black, white, young, old, Republican and Democrat say there needs to be a different narrative going forward. Mm. Uh, Greenwood Rising is needed now more than ever. And it really crystallized what we were doing. It made us really focus and dig in. Well, for me, it made yeah. me focus and dig in and say, you know, what we're doing is, is going to change not just Tulsa, yeah. but it can be a model for the country. And so, yeah, it, did, it really did brought some energy in. It's Wisdom Wednesday. We're talking about the wisdom of reckoning with race. We've had Hannibal Johnson, curator, and Phil Armstrong, executive director of the Greenwood Rising Museum. Well, let's go to Washington, D.C. and talk to Deborah who's on the line. Hi, Deborah. it's Dr. Anderson here. How are you today? Dr. Anderson, I'm doing very well. How are you doing? Oh, I'm alive and grateful. Thanks a lot for hanging out with me. What's your comment or question, please? For your guest, I was raised in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Still have lots of family there in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. I had heard somewhere along the line that there had been a bombing that was also done on Greenwood. Can he speak to that? Okay, uh, Hannibal Johnson or, or Phil Armstrong, was there a bombing? Is, is this uh, true? So the most comprehensive study of the, th this history was done by a commission that was created by the state in 1997, issued a report in 2001. One of the things they looked at was whether planes were used during the course of the massacre. So the answer to that is was definitive. Yes, planes were used. Mm. Yes, the, the planes were private planes. What did the planes do? It, it, it's highly likely that the planes, um, at, at a minimum, strafe the community with bullets. It is probable that at least one of the planes dropped some sort of devices, incendiary devices, on the community that caused the flames to spread more rapidly and burn more brilliantly. Huh. We have credible eyewitnesses like B.C. Franklin who say, you know, I saw the planes, I saw them dropping bombs, and, and so forth. Um, so 
So these are private planes. These are private that planes. Bomb in this community. They were commandeered mm -hmm. to uh, further the 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 people who invaded the community, further the efforts of the people who invaded and destroyed the community. I'm, I'm, thank you, by the way, Deborah. That was confirmed. So you, you got that answer. Is that right? Yes, sir. I did. Thank you. Blessings to you. 888 bridge if you want to give a call. You're just making me think now of, from a position I hadn't thought about before, Phil and Hannibal, and that was not just the incident but the trauma it must have been for the people at the time. You know, your subtitle, Hannibal Johnson in American City grapples with its historical racial trauma. I can't imagine, like I was in the military, you know, uh, eight years, Army. So when you, you know, and then living in inner city, it, play, it pieces uh, in my history, like in Chicago, you know, when I'm pastoring out in the suburbs, it's, it's different. When I'm pastoring in Cabrini Green at the time and you hear gunshots, kids hit the ground. So I can't imagine if you're hearing gunshots, seeing fires, and now you're telling me they're bombing from the top. How traumatic is that for people? You know, you touch on and you're bringing out exactly what one of the aspects of coming to Green and Rising. Um, I teach our docents and I actually did it this morning with a large group. When you go through the massacre exhibit, Green Rising, and you hear the voices of the survivors from 1997 and you watch the video and then you go beyond that and you see the aftermath and you see the buildings and you see the destruction. What's not there and what we talk about is the real trauma that came out of that and it came out because of what the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacy had the hold over the community from every level of government, the police department, all that. And I tell them the vernacular that would have been used at that time in the days after, because they talk about how come no one talked about it. And mm -hmm. I'll say, what mother wants to tell her children about their neighbor, their father, their grandfather being horrifically murdered on these streets? No one wants to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, I'll say the vernacular that would have been used is you better not say nothing. Right. You, you better keep your mouth shut. Right. You, you, you want, You're just going to cause more trouble. You, you want to get lynched? Mm -hmm. You see what they did? You don't want. And th so that trauma. Mm -hmm. Then, mm -hmm. after, let's say after six months, and you know that your home was burglarized, they took your cars, they took your china, they took your money. Could you, and I just put this as, as, as just imagine um, you see someone six months later driving your car, mm. and you can't say nothing about it. You see someone, someone wearing the jewelry that you know you bought your wife mm -hmm. and it's on someone else and you can't say nothing. Because if you do, you can, you can exactly. kill. And so I, I just give the human element to yeah. the level and the depth of trauma that this community went through. And yet they still had a we shall not be moved mindset. We yeah. will rebuild it again. It's incredible. 888 bridge I'm running to my commercial break right now. There's a human aspect here that you, we can't. Yes, it's an issue. Yes, it's history. Yes, it's a conversation. But at the end of the day, these were human beings, brothers and sisters and families. For you businessmen, who entrepreneurs who built businesses, businesswomen, you built a business. Can you imagine it being torched and blown up and done? Wow, all that work you put into it. Let me tell you something, friends. This is something that we need to learn about in our history. And it's sad. It's taken 100 years for some of us even to hear about it for the first time. We'll be right back. Happiness is closer than you think. My listeners already know I believe in professional counseling, and I'm happy to tell you how you can get outstanding counseling right at home, at work, or wherever you feel most comfortable. It's easy with eHome Counseling. You can get an outstanding counselor via video. It's convenient, confidential, and flexible. You know, sometimes life is hard, but eHome Counseling will help you. They'll help you through your struggles of depression, anxiety, addiction, or PTSD. eHome Counseling can help. And they take major insurance. So give them a call at 833-40-E-HOME. That's 833-40-E-HOME. Or catch them online, eHomeGroup.com. That's eHomeGroup.com. Happiness is closer than you think. Want more Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson? You can now catch Dr. Anderson's half-hour radio highlight show on Saturdays at 3 p.m. right here on WAVA 105.1. You'll enjoy recent conversations he's had with callers to this show. 
Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson, Weekend Edition, Saturday, 3 p.m. on WAVA. Check it out. For more information about Dr. Anderson, visit andersonspeaks.com. Does your church have legal challenges? McCullum & Associates has experience with pastor-church relations, administration and organizational issues, church liability and risk management, and real estate matters. This firm understands the legal aspects of the problems, as well as the spiritual implications of those same problems inside and outside the court. Call McCullum & Associates today at 301-864-6070. That's 301-864-6070. Welcome back to Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson. For more information about this program or for resources from Dr. Anderson, please visit andersonspeaks.com. To watch on Facebook Live or to view past episodes, visit Dr. Anderson's public figure Facebook page. Just search Dr. David Anderson and click like. You can also watch live on YouTube. Just search for Anderson Speaks, all one word, and make sure to subscribe. Join our text community and receive a free weekly text inspiration from Dr. Anderson. Just text the word INSPIRE to 97000. That's I-N-S-P-I-R-E to 97000. And now, back to Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson. That's me. Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson. Hannibal Johnson's hanging out with me. Phil Armstrong's hanging out with me. Uh, Hannibal Johnson's curator, uh, author as well on everything that's been going on in Black Wall Street, if you've ever heard that term before. Really, it's the Greenwood District uh, that was uh, terrorized back in uh, 1921, 100 years ago. Phil Armstrong's the executive director uh, of the museum. If you ever get a chance to come to Tulsa, this is my first time, gentlemen, uh, to Tulsa, and I'm grateful uh, to be here to bring racism uh, to Tulsa, to talk about racism and how God's grace can uh, can uh, overcome uh, racism, but then we sit here in your museum and we learn what uh, what this racism looks like. Uh, but it m most racism is not just individual; it's institutional and it's economic. And it looked like all of that converged on on this Black Wall Street Greenwood district that was set off and triggered by an, uh, an elevator incident between a teenage black boy, teenage black girl, and then the, the face-off happens, and then a gunshot goes off, and before you know it, they're, they're torching down these, these uh, businesses. You know the history probably better uh, than, than many folk, but I want to hear from you on what, did this mean, what does this mean now? We're, we, as we turn this corner, it's 2021. Why are we telling the story and what can we learn from it that makes it valuable? So someone who's driving through the nation's capital right now saying, okay, this is great. Add it to the history books. Why does this matter? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tra change the channel. I don't have time to just learn more history. I'm sorry it happened. Hopefully it'll never happen again, but let's move on. I think it matters because fundamentally this is connected to other historical events by what i call shared humanity so if if each of us recognize and validate the the dignity and worth of other human beings around us we wouldn't have an incident called the 1921 tulsa race massacre we wouldn't have a holocaust mm -hmm. you know in the 1940s we wouldn't have lynchings that occurred all throughout the united states we wouldn't have George Floyd. I mean, there's a lot of things that we wouldn't have. Which is recent. Right. Yeah. If, if we understood this concept of shared humanity and we actually lived, lived out that concept. So, sure. so that, that's yeah. one of the reasons it's important. And, and more directly in Tulsa, one of the reasons knowing this history is important is because we have fractured race relations here. And we have mm. a, a great deal of mis and distrust, particularly in the black community, with respect to the white community and white leadership. Does that still uh, linger because of, of yes. this? Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh -huh. not a no. And it's not, I mean, I think it's, it's perfectly rational and understandable why, why the mistrust exists. If you have a police department in your city that back in 1921 deputized people that killed your grandmother, 
right. then you might have a problem with the police. Yeah. I mean, that's just the way it works. Yeah, yeah. And do you think that the museum, Phil, helps to build that bridge? Well, th so <clears throat> this is exactly the, one of the things that we talk about. And so we have a discussion space. You, you go through it. We give opportunity for people to sit and talk about what they've experienced and what they see and bring their own perspectives to it. There is uh, a couple of points that give them things to talk about. And I will always point out, uh, people say, it's 100 years later. You know, why are we still dealing with mm -hmm. this? Why can't we just move on? And so I'll say, because we're still dealing with the remnants for that. Public health is one of the components. And I'll say, for example, um, the fear and distrust of white Tulsans and going to South Tulsa, um, even going to the hospital. There were three major hospitals that were in North Tulsa. After urban renewal, those hospitals went away. They were never rebuilt. Mm -hmm. So you have a, <clears throat> a mindset of people who don't trust a large contingent of the south side of town. Mm -hmm. So parents are not going to have direct access to health care because they're not going to take my child to the doctor unless they're really sick because i got to go to the white side of town. Mm -hmm. You don't rebuild hospitals. And so uh, one of our major foundations here, George Kaiser Family Foundation, does a study in 2008, I believe, and says that the average lifespan of a person born in North Tulsa is 7 to 14 years less than the person that's born in South Tulsa. Mm. And so the automatic... I would say small-minded, ignorant view would say, well, that's just because they're up there and they're members of gangs and they're shooting right. everybody and killing everybody. And there's, no, yeah. you don't build a hospital, rebuild hospitals. You have this fear and this element that's passed down from gener generation to generation. Mm. And then you have this despairing wealth health gap. Yeah. And it gives you a different perspective. Like, I never thought about it like that. So the remnants, as you say, and the leftover uh, damages as in the legal realm uh, have to be accounted for. When we get back from our last commercial break, I'm going to ask you for your final best comment to really help us wrap all this up together. This is Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson.
It's Real Talk with Dr. David Anderson. Been hanging out with Hannibal Johnson. He's curator of the Greenwood Rising Museum. And Phil Armstrong, the museum's interim executive director. We've been gaining uh, knowledge and wisdom and thoughts from them regarding uh, Tulsa and specifically the Tulsa race massacre we've learned just just a little bit if you get to the tulsa area make sure you come down to the greenwood district and check out uh, the greenwood rising museum and experience what uh, many are experiencing as they're trying to figure out so what was this black wall street or as hannibal johnson would say black main street and then uh why does it matter uh what uh terrible massacre happened. I'm going to ask you a quick question, and I'm going to ask you for a final comment, whatever final comment you want to make. But is it true that there were graves that were discovered recently? So there there are longstanding oral histories around the mass graves being in Tulsa. So the work now is to investigate to see whether, in fact, there are mass graves from the massacre. We can't answer that definitively yet. Okay. Uh, but it's an o- it's an open question that's been long standing. Okay, got it. And uh, final thoughts from you, uh, Phil Armstrong. You know, people keep asking, and some I should say, ask, how do you how will you measure success, and how will you know that you've done well? And I and I say that you know, twenty years from now, you know, twenty forty one, you know, no matter what school, public school that a student went to in Oklahoma, whether it be a major urban public school in Oklahoma City or Tulsa, or even in the panhandle in the rural areas, uh, never again will someone say, have you ever heard of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre and Black Wall Street? Uh, Every student will be able to say, Yes, because I was taught that in school. In school, mm-hmm. yeah, because they're not taught that in school now. now that, well, yeah. they're being taught that now, now, but it's the number of individuals that were never taught that. Now here locally, because yes. it's not uh, nationally. You're hoping 20 years from now every school every system Every school in Oklahoma, yeah. every school system in the United States. Okay. Final comment, Hannibal Johnson. Yeah, I think I love quotes. So uh, the, the quote I want to offer goes to the, the question – of the frustration that many of us feel around race and racism after working long and hard and and seeing or or feeling as though we take one step forward and two steps back because of George Floyd, because of legislation aimed at critical race theory, because of all these these different factors. So I I want to remind people of something Dr. King said. He said a lot of great things, obviously, but one of them was we must accept finite disappointment but never lose infinite hope. Mm. So hope is, is really a, a, a powerful concept, and it's something that we need to be mindful of if we're ever going to get to a point of racial reconciliation. How about that? Well, thank you both for doing the work that you are doing and with the, the work that you have done. And my prayer is that all the work that you're investing in would make a huge difference in racial reconciliation and bridge building, not only in Tulsa and Oklahoma, but really around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the opportunity you've given us just to learn even more about how the powerful uh, spirit can remind us that we are all one and help us to build those bridges of reconciliation so that we would recognize that and honor one another. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Together, everyone said, amen Amen. and amen. Help your children. i uh-huh.